It's certainly true to say that in the UK anyway, landscape architects are the only design discipline that are trained to think holistically in ecological terms about urban issues, as their equivalent of the RIBA, the Landscape Institute, were reminded recently. By definition, this is a holistic profession. That brings with it fantastic opportunities, but it also brings with it very considerable responsibilities to think that through in a systemic and strategic way. We are the people who can oversee everything. We understand about people and about place and about the importance of everything working together. This is a proactive championship role that is now necessary for the Institute and one which I'm absolutely certain will be embraced by the leadership of the Institute and by its membership, given the pivotal, absolutely crucial role that you play in society today. We have to assume a role of leadership within multidisciplinary teams. It's one of the driving um, aims of the Landscape Institute. We're drawing different specialists into our field now. Um, engineers who specialise in energy production, energy minimisation, people who, are, who taught the language of carbon. That didn't happen even a year ago, and that's all in response to climate change, of course. So there is a completely new agenda. It's unbelievably complex. So the only way you can achieve it is by people working together. And that's what we do in all the teams I work with. It brings together different professions, and the trick is to have leadership which can bring all of those things together, simply because it's so complicated. But there is, however, a problem. Although trained for this work, many landscape architects find themselves at the bottom of the food chain and shoehorned into a more interventionist way of doing things. Many are a little rusty on ecological design, and few know much about the new biomimicry systems. Others may just not be interested for one reason or another, though I hope they'll always try to make their schemes not so much carbon neutral, as architects are now expected to do, but actually carbon negative, because uniquely they can. But there's another problem. Both landscape architects and architects are expected to design beautiful things. And for the moment at least, the fashion is still for expensive, carbon-hungry schemes. I would think there's one basic way in which it, it needs to change, and that is to look less at the aesthetic and more at the, the, the sort of social, socio-economic, socio-political aspects of what they produce. It's going to be about how the space functions, how it meets the needs of the immediate community, how it looks at issues to do with energy use, how it meets the needs of a food production, how it meets the needs of education. And if it looks good, then so much the better. Some designers do do that. But there are a lot of other people outside of the charter professions who already possess many of the necessary skills and could make a major contribution if we could somehow conflate the alternative and the mainstream. So the second thing we can do, almost tomorrow, is to set up an herbal institute based here in Leeds, why not, to develop and share techniques amongst the design professionals, politicians, growers, businesses, street and city champions, whoever needs them. The institute will need many links at many levels, with professional bodies, local authorities, colleges, NGOs, community groups and so on. It'll need to have an open door, open source, horizontal policy, and it'll need to employ transdisciplinary rather than conventional multidisciplinary techniques. And it'll need to have permeable boundaries. It'll need input from a number of different professions, from academics, from the corporate sector. But because herbalism is as much about engagement and cooperation, it also needs to attract and embrace and learn from the many expert amateurs who remember the things that the professionals have forgotten. It won't be like any existing institute, but it will do all the usual things, conducting research, advising government on policy, running and cascading courses at every level from PhDs through to night classes right across the country and whatever else it takes. It is a big ask at a time when money is tight, but I don't think we have a choice, do you? <laughs>
For many people, the word utopia means an unachievable ideal, and it's certainly true that most of these ideas, from Karl Marx right back to Plato, have failed because they relied too heavily on altruism and they were defeated by the selfish gene. But this time, it's different. This time, for the first time ever, it's not about altruism or ideals. It's about survival in a very grim reality. We need what I call utopian realism. That is, we need to think beyond the world as we see it at the moment. You need an element of utopian thinking. If you look at a city or for example, you think, how could it be radically different? But it has to be realistic because the issues of sustainability are real. Even if climate change wasn't happening, it would make sense to have industries which didn't pollute the environment. It would make sense not to destroy the soil. It would make sense not to have social injustice. So actually, many of the things that we need to do to address climate change are things that we need to do anyway. So really, actually, it doesn't matter if you believe in climate change. Do you want a better planet? Do you want a better future for your children and for yourself? I think that's the simplest argument. I think we have all the time we want to have. People will realise the situation, we will work together, and therefore I'm very optimistic and positive that we will get through this in an appropriate way. If you research into urban agriculture, you very quickly come to those famous campaigns, like the Dig for Victory campaign, where basically from one day to the next, you trans form your landscape into one that can feed yourself. In the end, I think you either approach this uh, with an optimistic or a pessimistic frame of mind, and it's very easy to talk ourselves into a gloom and say we're all doomed, but that isn't going to motivate anybody to do anything. And the thing about humankind's existence on the earth is we have shown an astonishing capacity to adapt. Absolutely astonishing. And it seems to me that all of the building blocks that we need in terms of science, technology, inventiveness, resourcefulness, you know, politics and so on, are there and if we use that, then uh, I think the challenge can be overcome because in the end we're quite rational. And you look at what the majority of scientific opinion is saying, you have to beat back the sceptics because now is the time for getting on with it, not for stopping. And if you do that, then I am an optimist that we will make the change that is needed. Why would we not want to?